This is the 18th in a series of lectures on algebra for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In this lecture we'll talk about uh, plane algebraic curves and field extensions. First let's think about what are called transcendental numbers. Transcendental numbers. Uh, those are complex numbers. Um, so uh, a, a number, a complex number, an alpha and the complex numbers is called, uh, well, it's called algebraic. Um, if p of alpha is zero, where p of x is uh, some uh, rational coefficient polynomial in x uh, and not the zero polynomial. And it's called transcendental alpha is, a complex number alpha is transcendental if it's not algebraic. So it's a funny way of saying not algebraic. Similarly, we could ask if we had any um, any field extension, so capital K and little k, some field extension. Um, we could say that a, an element alpha in the big field is, uh, is algebraic over the little field if alpha um, if p of alpha is zero for some p of x with coefficients in the littler field and not the zero polynomial. And similarly, we'd say that alpha is transcendental complex or complex element or an element of this larger field um, is a transcendental element if it's not algebraic. So um, we've understood a little bit about what algebraic extensions look like, extending by algebraic elements. What about transcendental extensions? If we have any uh, field extension, um, then um, suppose we take an al element alpha and k, then we can say that alpha is transcendental. We want to understand what do these transcendental things, what do they look like in some sense? Uh, it's transcendental if and only if the field generated by taking all elements of k and adding alpha to it, so that's the field consisting of p of alphas over q of alphas, rational functions of alpha, or p of x over q of x is a rational function um, with q of alpha not zero. So that's what q of uh, k of alpha means, all the expressions you can make out of alpha uh, wh that are rational functions of alpha. Um, uh, is and this field is isomorphic to the abstract field k of x. X here is a is a, ver a single variable. Um, so this field k of alpha is is of course contained inside the big K. So we start with the field extension big K of little k, and then we take an element of, the, of that big K. We want to know if it's transcendental. What we, uh, what, well how do we check? We can check if it's transcendental when the field it generates inside the k is just isomorphic to the field generated by an abstract variable. And the proof is fairly easy. Um, uh, so first thing we can do is to look for, um, we can look for uh, uh, what happens if alpha is transcendental. Uh, if it's transcendental, uh, that means exactly that um, Q of alpha is not zero, and that's for all Q of x any polynomial in little k, which is not the zero polynomial, not the zero polynomial, um, and uh, and therefore that says exactly that P of alpha over Q of alpha uh, is defined because this Q of alpha is not zero, and that's for any rational um, function k of x. But then we can um, we can therefore define a map which simply takes um, x uh, in uh, well takes x in k of x uh, maps it to alpha in k of alpha and extend it to a map on polynomials of any or rational functions on any rational function. Uh, we just map it to its value at alpha and its value at alpha is defined, um, and that sits inside this guy. And that maps onto because the, the definition of the field is it's all the rational functions of alpha with, with little k coefficients. And so that's onto this map. And um, we only have to check that it's one to one. 
and we've said before it was an exercise that um, to check that something's one to one, it's good enough to check that its kernel is zero. So we can check the kernel of this map is zero. Um, is this map zero? In other words, if this guy goes to zero, that would be p of uh, alpha over q of alpha being zero. Map maps p of alpha over q of alpha. If p of alpha over q of alpha is zero, that's exactly when p of alpha is zero, and p of alpha being zero by alpha being transcendental, that's exactly when p of x is the zero polynomial in x, um, which is exactly when um, when the rational function p of x over q of x is the zero function. So the kernel is exactly the zero function. So therefore, we've checked that this map is onto and that it's one to one. And again, it's an exercise to check that that ensures that, that there's a there's a unique inverse morphism. On the other hand, we could ask, uh, what if there is just an abstract? Our problem is to show that what if there's an abstract isomorphism between the two fields? It doesn't arise in this simple way. Um, so we've now found that if, a, if alpha is transcendental, then there is such an isomorphism. But what if there's such an isomorphism? So suppose we take an isomorphism, say phi takes k of x to k of alpha. We have no guarantee that x goes to alpha. We don't know that anymore. Um, we don't know where it goes. And so we'll let, let's say, beta be simply defined to be um, phi of x. Uh, the x polynomial, where does it go? It goes to something we'll call beta. And then from there on, of course, phi of any rational function must be exactly um, p of beta over q of beta, because it's a morphism of, of fields, so it, it preserves all the operations, all the arithmetic operations that produce these polynomials, and so you just calculate it out. Um, so this means in particular that um, that we must have, uh, because this is an isomorphism, uh, it must be the case of this. So this is an isomorphism, and so it creates uh, a copy of of k of x inside. It produces a k of a k of x gets mapped to k of beta inside uh, field capital K. Um, but if we said it was an isomorphism by definition, isomorphism to k of alpha, and so k of beta is k of alpha. Um, and so they are, in fact, the same field. And so this isomorphism is an isomorphism to k of alpha. Why is it? Why are that? Why is that? Why is that equal? Well, we said that beta, um, by this isomorphism here, uh, had had beta in its image. So beta is certainly in the image of this map, um, and alpha is also in the image. But um, but the map is an isomorphism to this guy here. Um, so beta is uh, beta is sitting in here, and so beta must be in. I must have beta in k of alpha, but this map is a, is an isomorphism, and so it's onto, and so it hits alpha, and so something, uh, some some rational function goes to alpha. Um, so we have some rational function, some say p naught of x over q naught of x goes to alpha, but that th what does it go to? It goes to p naught of beta over q naught of beta, and so that shows that alpha is, and so we've got beta is in k of alpha here. Now we've got alpha is in k of beta, and so they're the same field. Um, each is just generated by add. That's generated by adding alpha. That's generated by adding beta. But they're both in those fields, so they're the same field. So um, at that point, we have some sense of what what the transcendental extensions look like. They just added something like an abstract variable. Um, let's think about how would we find all of the finite fields. Uh, we want to produce them by repeated extensions. Let's classify all of them. And for the rest of the argument, we'll just pick p a prime, because we know that all the finite fields have a uh, characteristic p, which is, again, an exercise for you to show. In other words, all the finite fields have some uh, some standard finite field inside. Let's let k be uh, z mod pz. And so let's look for all the, this guy is going to be inside. Any finite field is going to have some one of these in it for a unique p. Um, and so let's look for the ones that have this particular one. Um, so let's try to construct an example of a finite field, then we'll try and see why that's what, why that's the only possible example. So we'll pay, take an integer, um, take an integer n which is positive, and look at the polynomial x to the p to the n minus x, and we'll call that c of x, is x to the p to the n minus x. Now um, it has some obvious factors; it's not irreducible. It has some obvious factors. There's an x in it. And then there's an x minus 1 in it, because you plug in x is 1, it certainly vanishes. So it must be divisible by x minus 1. 
And then after that, it's a little bit more mysterious, so let's just call the rest of it b of x. And that's sort of mysterious as to what exactly that is. But we can actually, we can actually factor it out explicitly by hand. If we plug and try, and, try and, and, and divide those expressions into this one, we'll find that actually it's x times x minus 1. And we can work out what this b of x is by dividing these into here um, explicitly. We get x to the minus 2 plus p to the n plus x to the minus 3 plus p to the n plus dot 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 plus x plus 1. Um, so I won't uh, do that for you. You can expand this out and check that it does give you this. Now, I want to show that this uh, polynomial here, x to the p to the n minus x, actually is a product um, of, uh, has, uh, sorry, has no multiple roots. So that's the next, um, uh, so c of x has no multiple roots. Uh, and, and I don't just want to say over k, but oh, in fact over any extension of little k. Remember, little k was uh, z mod pz. So uh, I'm saying I'm fixing the prime p, and we're working with a given p all the way through. This guy has no multiple roots. So um, what we can note here to try and prove this is that this b of x we have explicitly here. If we plug in, we find b of 0 is 1. And we also find b of 1 is expressible explicitly as it's p to the n minus 1, which over uh, over uh, find a field of characteristic p is just minus 1 because that's 0. Um, and so and that so it gives us b of 1 is minus 1, which also is not 0. And this guy is not 0. So there's no roots at 0 and 1. So b of x has no roots at x is 0 or at x is 1. That implies then the multiple roots of b of x have to be somewhere else. But uh, c of x has this additional root, single root at 0, single root at 1, and then it has the roots of b of x. And so multiple roots of b of x are exactly multiple roots of c of x. They have to be somewhere other than 0 and 1, and so they're the same multiple roots, multiple, sorry, multiple roots of c of x. So they have the same multiple roots. So now to find multiple roots, we always look for derivatives. We can calculate the derivative of c of x um, and it's um, the derivative of uh, x to the p to the n minus x, which is, um, of course, p to the n x to the p to the n minus 1 minus 1 plus p to the n minus 1. And this is 0, so it's minus 1. And so there are no multiple roots of b of x or c of x. I suppose that should be... Um, that b of x and c of x have no multiple roots. We could put that in. Um, no multiple roots. Now c of x has no multiple roots at all. As, as our next lemma, let's suppose um, suppose we start with a finite field, um, which is going to be an extension of our given. Um, so we'll take a um, lemma. Suppose we have k over k as a finite field. So it's finite with many elements. Um, and again, k little k is uh, as above. It's our z mod pz, um, the characteristic subfield. Um, then the Frobenius morphism is the map. I'll write as f of x is x to the p um, is a, is an automorphism. So we, we know from previous experience that we're really interested in automorphisms. And in fact, we're really interested in Galois um, extensions and that sort of thing. So it's an actually an automorphism, k to k, and its identity on little k. Now, well it's easy to prove that it's a morphism. Um, so it has to take 0 to 0, but it's just taking p to the power, 0 power, uh, p power of 0 is 0. p to the power of 1 is 1. So that's easy enough. If you multiply two things together, b and c, and take their p to power. It's the same as b's p to power, c's p to power. So that works. So 0, 1, and multiplication works. The tricky thing is addition when we, uh, sorry, got p. Um, yeah, p to power. OK, so, um, so the tricky thing is the addition. And if you expand that out using the binomial theorem, you get, remember, binomial theorem works perfectly fine in any commutative ring, which is not hard to prove. So you get p to the b to the p, p1, b to the p minus 1, c, b2, b to the p minus 2, 
C2 plus da 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 and eventually you get things like B uh, P J B to the P minus J C the J plus da 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 and all the way down to C to the P. But I claim there's a factor of P in all of these. Factor of P in all of these and P is zero in our field. So these all have factors of P and P is zero and so it simplifies to b to the p plus c to the p. And I'll leave you to figure out why there's a factor of p in all those using, um, looking at just by looking at factorials. Um, expand them as factorials. So uh, so we find that b plus c to the p is b to the p plus c to the p. And so that takes care of addition, multiplication, and zeros. So we can see this thing is actually a morphism of fields. A morphism of fields, not just rings, it's actually taking one to one. So it's morphism of commutative rings with one. And since it's taking a field to a field, it's actually a field morphism. We'd like to see that it's an automorphism. Is it one to one? It does take the field k to itself. Uh, it's one to one. Why? Because um, if it were zero on something, that would mean that b to the p was zero. Um, but if the pth power of something is zero, we're, in, we're working over a field, so uh, the element has itself has to be zero. And um, uh, finally, uh, the fact that it's one to one Im implies so now it's so one to one is done. And in fact, that implies that it's onto because it's uh, it's a one-to-one -one mapping from a finite set to itself. Um, um, so when you have a finite set of things and you shuffle them around by one-to-one -one mapping, that mapping's always onto. And that completes um, the proof that that's an automorphism. So finally, we can we can start um, work on a on our big theorem, our classification theorem, um, which is that. Um, uh, if uh, if we have p a prime, uh, then um, the splitting field of um, c of x equals x to the p to the n minus x over little k equals z mod p z. Um, let's make the splitting field capital K. Uh, we'll call it that. Um, is a finite field. with exactly p to the n elements, all of which are roots. Of c of x, so you just add in the roots and there you are, you have it, um, you have the field. Um, and then we have the surprising result that every um, finite field k is uh, uh, obtained this way, and for in fact a unique um, for a unique uh, p and n, and so it has p to the n elements. And so, in particular, it's determined by knowing how many. If you know how many elements there are in it, uh, then you know exactly which field it is. It's this field splitting a uh, field for this polynomial. So um, let's see how we prove this result. Suppose that alpha and beta are roots uh, of C of x arising in the splitting field. So we construct a splitting field for this given C of x, construct talk the capital K splitting field. Suppose we took two roots, then automatically uh, the p to the n power of their product will be the product of their p to the n powers. Um, and since they're roots, they have to satisfy the, the equation that c, oops, that c uh, is, is zero. So the p to the nth power of, ever, of, 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 this, of the root has to be equal to the root. So this guy has to be an alpha, and this guy has to be a beta. So to be a root of this guy, it has to be the case that the pth power of an, of an x, the p to the nth power, has to be x. And so alpha and beta are roots of that, so p to the nth power of alpha is alpha, p to the nth power of beta is beta. Um, but that means p to the nth power of alpha beta is alpha beta. And so um, so the roots, um, uh, uh, well, product of roots is root. Uh, the product of any two roots is a root. And so there's, we can multiply them together and get more roots. Uh, but then the more sophisticated trick is if you take alpha plus beta to the p to the n, and you expand it out just the same way we did before, um, you get, of course, this is a, this is, uh, and not just p, but p to the nth power, so maybe some of positive integer n, but by the same trick we did before, by expanding in a binomial, you get that this guy is 
this guy, and then alpha, um, uh, to, sorry, alpha to the p to the n is just alpha, beta to the p to the n is beta, and so alpha plus beta to the p to the n is alpha plus beta, and so that shows us that this is also a root. There's sum of sum of roots, so alpha and beta are roots. Sum of roots is a root because it satisfies the equation that its p to the nth power is itself. And so that's being a root of c of x. So that shows, therefore, that ro the roots, um, a set of roots of c of x is contained in k and it forms a field because uh, you can all do, do your do your arithmetic with them and you get more elements. Um, so, uh, uh, well, of course, we should also do subtraction, but by the obvious, the same uh, same uh, calculation would give a subtraction. And you can see, that, of course, that 0 and 1 are obviously in there. So you get actually a, a field inside here. Um, and so, um, you know, and you could also, I suppose we could also do reciprocals. I'll leave, leave you to check reciprocals. So um, so you can see that you get, you get a field inside. But by definition of a splitting field, it's generated by the roots. It is the field generated by the roots. So, uh, so that means, therefore, that the set of roots, um, set of roots of C of x, is a field containing the roots of C of x generated by the roots of C of x. But the splitting field is also such a field, and so they must be the same field. So that means, therefore, that that, that the splitting field consists precisely of just exactly the roots of that polynomial. Now we need to try the other direction of the of the theorem. We need to figure out if we had any finite field, why it has to be one of these. So let's suppose we tar start with L as some finite field. And the finite field, of course, has to have positive characteristic. So it's characteristic of L as some prime uh, some prime P. That's a P B is characteristic, and that's a prime integer. And then we know, of course, that we've, as we've seen in, I guess, in various exercises at this point, L uh, must contain Z mod PZ, which we'll call little k is gain. So it has this this um, this characteristic subfield inside it. Being a finite field, it has to have positive characteristics. It has to have p prime integer, not zero. And then it has to have this inside it. Um, and so therefore, L is a is a k vector space. At this point, we'll use a, s a bit of linear algebra, assuming you've seen a little bit of abstract linear algebra. Um, and so uh, if you haven't, this may not make much sense to you. Uh, let's not worry about that. Uh, so this is a k-vector space. It's a finite k-vector space. So its dimension as a vector space is some integer n. Let's call it n. So that's an integer greater than or equal to 0. Well, actually, it has to be greater than 0 because it already has k inside it, and k is already one-dimensional. So it has to have a positive uh, degree. And, uh, and then once you know uh, the dimension of a vector space, you know that it's therefore, as a vector space, it's going to be isomorphic to k to the n, but k has p elements, and so uh, so therefore L has uh, p to the n elements. Now we can consider the the Frobenius endomorphism. Um, Frobenius morphism x goes to x to the p, um, and that's going to take L to L itself. It's an automorphism. Of course, it's going to operate on k as the identity. So it's going to act, uh, act as 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 as, um, as elements of the Galois group. So it'll generate this particular element of the Galois group will generate some subgroup. So this generates a subgroup of um, the Galois group of of L over K. And those transformations, because L is is a finite set of of elements, those transformations must act as permutations. And so these are, in fact, permutations of L. But L is finite, and so the number of permutations is finite. And so, um, so therefore, it's a finite group. It generates a finite, a finite group. And it's generated by one element, and so it's what's called a cyclic group. And we're assuming a little bit of group theory that you hopefully have at this point from our other classes. And um, if you haven't got it, that's fine. We can... This proof isn't really essential. This is the only proof where I'll use any abstract linear algebra. It's also the only proof where I'll use any group theory. Um, so this is a finite cyclic group. Um, and so it must be Z mod um, LZ by the classification of finite uh, cyclic groups for some integer L greater than 0. Um, but that exactly implies, therefore, that, um, that if you do it uh, L times, you get back to what you started with. So x to the p to the L is x 
for some L. And then uh, from there, it's not hard to show that, in fact, this, this, this particular uh, field must be the field that we have already found. The, the, the splitting field of, of, this, of this particular guy is, um, uh, is, is going um, to be exactly L. I'll leave you to work out the rest of the details. So um, that's very abstract because it tells us how to construct these things. We could, in principle, use it to actually make fields. And there are examples in the notes of, of, of constructing fields explicitly as, as algebraic objects with algebraic manipulations. But it would be nice if we could think about some drawings. Now, we can't really draw the finite fields very well. But let's draw real variable pictures and imagine that, they're, that we're really talking about arbitrary fields. But We'll picture them with with uh, we'll picture them with with uh, curves in the plane. So let's start off with our with a favorite curve in the plane. So C is some um, curve caught in a plane uh, plane algebraic curve cut out by some equation like this. Um, so it's a, let's suppose it's an irreducible plane algebraic curve. And um, we're interested in trying to understand something about its its function field. So, and this is over some field K. So, it has a uh, a field of rational functions, which is an extension of K. Now, suppose that we have some larger field that extends that one. Um, so, we have some bigger field, capital K, which extends this one. And just for simplicity, we'll assume that it's extended by just a single element. Of course, if it was extended by finitely many elements, we could do them one at a time. So k is given by k of c with some element alpha extended. Now, um, we've already seen that if alpha were transcendental, let's do that case first. If alpha were transcendental, um, that would be exactly saying that um, k of c of alpha is the same isomorphic to k of c of an abstract variable z. We'll call it z because we've already used x and y for the variables in the plane for our plane algebraic curve. This is a curve in some x, y plane. Of course, it could be over an arbitrary field at this point, so it doesn't really have a geometric picture unless the ha field happens to be the real numbers. Um, so if the little k was the real numbers, you'd get this sort of picture. And otherwise, we're just imagining something like that as intuitively what we're thinking of is what an algebraic curve might sort of look like, although it doesn't have a precise description as a picture over arbitrary fields. So we can say then we've just added a variable. And um, so we start off with our picture, uh, which we've just drawn here. Uh, just draw it again, the same sort of picture of an algebraic curve in the x, y plane. That's the curve C we started with. And now what we've done is to add a variable z. So you can imagine it's going to become a three-dimensional picture, um, an x and a y. And, um, and then we'll trace out the same curve we had here in the x, y plane. But over top of it, we'll produce, um, we'll produce a surface, which will be, and I'm not going to be very precise about what exactly is an algebraic surface. We won't worry about too much detail. But you can see the idea that you've added an abstract variable z into this field. And so you now you've got a z direction you can move in. When you try and move around in, x in the xy directions, you can only move on the curve c. They were supposed to work with rational functions of c, so they should be living here, functions on here, on the points of the curve. But this guy, when you throw in an extra z variable, it gives you just an x direction. It creates what we could call the cylinder uh, on the curve C. Um, so it makes a kind of it's a cylinder surface. Um, so it's intuitive that what we've done is to is to stretch this guy up in in this one direction. Take the original curve C we started with and sort of stretch it up and produce uh, a cylinder surface on it. But what happens if it's only al um, an, an, an algebraic? If alpha is algebraic, so that was with alpha was transcendental. But now if alpha is algebraic, what happens? Um, then it's given by the vanishing of some, it satisfies some, some uh, equation, a uh, polynomial equation, f of alpha is 0, where f of z is a polynomial in a single variable z, um, but with coefficients in, uh, in the field uh, k of c which means that the coefficients are rational functions. So it's a polynomial in z. It has various powers of z in it. But the coefficients in the front are rational. And we can just multiply out denominators. Um, we can take out all the, multiply out the denominators, and get that it's actually a polynomial equation. f of x, y, z is 0. Um, so we've, we've started with our curve c. Um, 
and then we've said that we've added an additional variable z, but alpha is supposed to be a root of this polynomial in z, which is this guy here. And so effectively what we've done is to create some object which I'll call d, which is, uh, is a curve in some sense. It consists of the points that have to satisfy this equation, which is, after all, the equation of c itself. x and y still have to be bound together by this relationship here that forced x and y to, uh, that, that gives us the right, the right rational functions to be on k of c. And then uh, we have to add a z variable, but then add in the relationship that this guy is zero. This is again, it's a polynomial relation. So what does that look like in a picture? What you can say is that you'd now have to have a z variable again, just like we did before. Um, but uh, so there's got to be a z. And just like before, we've got the equation still satisfied by the original algebraic curve down on the xy plane, which you can think of as z is zero in the picture. Um, and we've got this surface still, which I call the cylinder surface, looking something like this. Um, so we've got some kind of surface like this, but that would be a surface cut out by posing only this, imposing only this equation and no equation on z. And that was what we had when, we, when things were transcendental. We didn't have any equation on z at all, but now we have this additional information, an equation on z. So that equation on z then cuts out that we have to stay somewhere on something that lives on, it has to still satisfy the equation of the, um, it, has, it has to still satisfy the equation that p of x and y is zero, so it, so it, so it lies on this cylinder surface above the, above the plane algebraic curve, but it has, to, uh, it has to be a curve cut out by this additional equation, because now we've got an equation on z, it can't vary freely, it has to, uh, it has to be bound by that additional equation to lie inside a curve on that surface. We haven't even made a definition of what is a curve on a surface, um, but that's the, the intuitively reasonable notion we'd expect to have. Moreover, we can see how to map uh, D down to C um, by just saying that each red point on the curve D uh, maps down to its shadow down here on the on the curve C. And so this is the, what am I saying? This is, um, Let's get rid of that. Uh, so this was the equation of the curve C. Um, so, so intuitively, you've got this kind of ma map here, which is, of course, a regular map down to C. And that map is really just given by x, y. Each x, y, z point gets mapped to its x, y coordinates, forgetting the z. And that takes you down to the curve C. We could always ask, I is this really, um, is, there, is there already maybe, um, is there already some root beta a root in k of c. What if there is a root to this f of z is zero equation? What if there already is such a root? Well, then that would be, of course, beta would be some beta is beta of x and y. It's in it's it's in this field. So that's field of rational functions. So it's a f it's a rational function of x and y, restricted to the curve. And it has to sa has to be uh, a root to this equation in z. This equation in z we said had coefficients, which were rational functions of x and y. And we could expand them out and make it into a polynomial, and so it became a polynomial f of x and y and z. But now z is going to be this beta of x y rational function. And so what we found is that um, this is for beta in the on the curve. So in a picture, what that looks like is that um, every point of the curve C is mapped upwards to a corresponding point up on D um, by this map beta. Setting z equals beta uh, traces out, as you move along C, it traces out D upstairs, at least rationally. It's a rational function, so it's not defined everywhere. But it says, therefore, that it, it draws uh, the corresponding point up on D that, that, that has to correspond to a point down on C, and all but finally many points will correspond to something. The beta is defined everywhere except finally many points of C and it will draw out D. So it'll lift, in some sense, you could say it sort of lifts um, in the picture. It lifts the curve C up to trace out D. But again, it's only, it's not a, not a, not a regular lift. It's just a rational lift. So we have, this, we have this regular map, and then this beta was supposed to be a, a rational map, not of everywhere to find dots to say it's not a regular map, it's a rational map. For example, um, we could say that if, um, if D is, um, is irreducible and, um, 
and D to C is not an isomorphism, uh, well, not, not uh, rational isomorphism, isomorphism on the rational functions, there is no such lift. For example, if, if D to C were, were, were several valued, um, like in our picture, we had our little cylinder um, surface and we had D sitting on it and C downstairs. If D were to somehow travel along the surface in such a way that the projection mapping down to C was, was many to one, then of course there's no way that the two could be, that it could be birationally related. And so, um, because the birational might be defined everywhere except to finitely many points, it cut out finitely many vertical stripes. And otherwise it'd have to be a one-to-one -one and on-to mapping. And that's not going to happen if it's if it's several to one at on some region, so to speak. So that gives us an idea how we could sort of imagine a non-trivial field extension as a non-trivial way that one curve in sitting inside a cylinder surface of another actually live, lives over top of it. D lives over top of C in some complicated way with, with several sort of sheets of it or strands of it living over a single strand of C. And similarly, we could think about the Galois group um, in this setting, um, what we're imagining is that, is that on our on our cylinder surface, we'd have some kind of picture of um, of several strands of D being swapped by the Galois group, because each strand intuitively is some little way of lifting up a little bit of of D that lives over some point of C. Um, it's some point up here that goes down to a point of C, and um, and the Galois group will swap those while leaving the points of C the same. So it flips up, up and down these, uh, moves up and down these, these various strands in our picture uh, without doing anything to C itself. So they stay, that, that strand, the point at this point, the strand moves up to this point and that one goes down. Um, so they stay over top of the same underlying point of C underneath. And so you can see a kind of intuitive picture of what, of what the, uh, the Galois group uh, action should look like. And a similar picture in, um, uh, similar ideas uh, should happen in all dimensions, but of course the pictures become uh, not uh, so uh, not so easy to draw.